<laughs> Love you guys. You did a great job. Join me in your Bibles tonight in Psalms chapter 35. Psalms chapter 35. Pastor said, if I can get done before the first quarter, I get a one week's bonus. <laughs> So I'm going to talk fast. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> that was actually a hint. Maybe I can negotiate. Psalm 35. Give you just a moment to find that. I hope you're there already. I hope you got an outline. If you didn't, Don's going to jump back up on his feet and bring you one. If you didn't get one of those, you're going to want that tonight. Just raise your hand. Donna, get one right to you. We're continuing our series in the book of Psalms. We are up to Psalm chapter 35. After 34, we jumped ahead to chapter 61, I believe it was, but we pushed rewind and came back to where we were at in Psalms 35. Tonight, I want to talk to you from here about the Lord, our Lord, the Lord of heaven, that he is the avenger of his people, that he is the avenger of his people, that he defends us, that he fights for us, that he's on our side, that no matter what goes on in our life, you can always count on God being on your side. If you're grateful for that, say amen. amen. This psalm, a few background notes before we read it. This psalm is simply titled in your Bible. You'll see the inscription there. It just says a psalm of David. We do know this is what's called an imprecatory psalm. I had to practice that a few times. Imprecatory without making this microphone pop too much. And that is asking God in very strong terms to defeat and to destroy the enemies of God's people. There's not that many of them out of the 150 chapters, but they are there. Specifically here, David is invoking God's aid, contrasting the hypocrisy, cunningness, and malice of his enemies with his own personal integrity and generosity. As we read through the chapter, you will see this. One theologian described this chapter this way, said... Psalm 35 is an outpouring rather than a coherent, organized poem. This psalm belongs to a time when in enmity and suffering were seemingly endless, end quote. David was in a tough place at this particular time. Some Bible scholars find it difficult to assign this psalm to any particular period in David's life. However... This phrasing that we find in Psalms 35, 1 in just a moment is similar to what David said to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse number 15. So I look at it that this could be linked to the period of David's life when Saul was pursuing him for his destruction. An overview of this chapter shows us the hurts, difficulties, and troubles that David is facing. Let me give them to you in brevity, and then we will read beginning in verse number one. In this chapter, we will find that persons that David had once befriended, verse 12, now fight against him, verse number one. They sought his life and plotted his ruin, verse number four. They built a trap for him to fail in in verse number 7. They have ruthlessly made false accusations in verses 11 and 20. They have jeered and mocked him in verse number 15. They've gloated over his own calamities in verses 19, 21, and 25 and overall consider themselves to be far better than David verse number 26. If there would ever be a time in a person's life that they could label that season of their life as a dirty, rotten, lousy, no good, dirty dog time. That's where David finds himself at in writing this psalm. Falsely accused. Enemies with no just cause of accusation against him. David makes in this chapter three requests to God that God eventually does answer for him. And we're going to use those three requests as a division of our study tonight. The first one is David's asking God to protect him. We're going to read verses one through ten and then talk about it. 
Verse 1, plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net from me in a pit which they have dug without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly and let his net that he has hidden catch himself. Into that very destruction let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. In verse number one, David, right out of the very beginning of this journal entry in Psalms 35, he's mixing or merging two images here in verse one. One of the courtroom, the law court, where he says, plead my cause. And also the battlefield is the obvious other image that he's chosen here. David has chosen to take up his cause in God's court. Saul has chosen the battlefield for David's destruction. And and in, in the midst of all of this, David is turning to the Lord and asking him to be his advocate and to be his judge. You can have no one better to defend you than God when you stand in your integrity with God. When you know that you're in right relationship with him, when you know that you have got a confidence that you've searched your heart and you know you're right with God, David finds himself in this place. This enemy has hated David. They lied about him. They persecuted him and they are pursuing him so much so that they've even set a trap for him in verse number seven that most likely was a net in a pit covered by leaves and branches in order to catch David and in order to trap him, to ensnare him, as the new, as the King James Version says. Even though David, even though David has an unjust enemy trying to take his life, trying to pursue him and track him down, David continues to do what he's always done, and that is in the good times and in the bad times to sing praises to the Lord. There's a very real lesson there for us as believers in Jesus Christ that we always have a song on our lips for God. That we always become, always are men and women, not just of only prayer, but also praise offered to God. Listen to me, folks. Anybody can sing praises to God when everything's going good. Anybody. That's the easiest thing to do. That's like loving people who love you. That's easy. It's fun even, you know. You love me. I love you, you know. Let's, let's uh, you know, just sit around and have coffee and chat and enjoy the day together. But to love your enemies, whole different story. Much more difficult challenge. Same thing when it comes to praising God. I can praise God when I wake up in the morning and I can actually get out of bed in less than five minutes and start moving around. But how about the days when I wake up and my body says, oh, yeah, you're that old and some, you know, and I sit on the edge of my bed. And my wife asked me the other day, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just trying to warm up, baby. <laughs> I said, some days I feel like an old 67 Chevy. I just got to start it and let it run for a little bit, you know, let it idle, let it get ready to go. You see, praising God should be done in the good times, obviously, but also in the difficult times. I would, I would even go one step further and say even more so in the difficult times. You want to build up your own spirit in the Lord? You want to make your enemy mad? <laughs> As you begin to praise God when the enemy thinks they got you right where they want you. 
When Satan thinks he's finally discouraged you, he finally found the one thing that was going to put you in a fetal position and make you cry like a hungry six-month-old baby. And instead, you stand on your feet with hands toward heaven and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. I'll tell you one that will really make you mad. Start singing that old hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Listen to me, folks. The time for us to sing praise to God is not just in the good times, but David has shown us even in hot pursuit, being pursued by the enemy of your soul is a great time to offer praise to God. David wasn't going to change his activity with God of praising him just because he's having a bad day. He kept it up. In fact, I want us to read it just to see it. Look at verse 9 and 10 again. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. I love how it's said like that. He said, it's going to happen. My soul may not even feel like it, but by the time I'm done talking to my soul, it's going to be singing. We're going to worship God. We're going to praise Him. And in the midst of being pursued and calling on God to fight for Him, to defend Him, to take up His cause, and to war for Him, and to call God to protect Him in the midst of all of His difficulties. And they haven't changed. When he got to verse 9, we're not done. We go all the way to verse 28. This battle is not over. The war has not been won. But he pauses here and makes it a point that I'm going to praise God in this very moment. So he called on God to protect him. Second of all, I want you to see this second request to God. And that is this. He asked God to reward me. He asked God to reward him. Let's begin in verse number 11 or continue in verse number 11 down to verse 18. And David says this, Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavenly, he heavily as one who mourns for his mother. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me, and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feasts, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. Then notice verse 18. I will, say I will. I will. Say it one more time. I will. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. David here states the evidence that proves that he was innocent. Notice how he says it in the first few verses of this segment. He said that they have rewarded him evil for his good that he offered to them. And that it brought sorrow to us. So you've, you've felt that sting before from someone, I'm sure. Someone that thinks evil of the good that you've done. That you do something kind for someone and then they accuse you of having ulterior motives. Or you were only doing it because somehow or another at the end of the day you would gain from doing it. That you're just kind of gamey and shady and selfish like that. To have your good evil spoken of. That's what David is referring to here. He was referring to having done good things. What were those good, those good things? Verse 13. But as for me, he's contrasting. He said this is what they've done. They're rewarding me evil for my good. He said this, but as for me, in other words their evil that they've done I rewarded good for it. Look at it. When they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. He was saying this, when they were sick, it broke my heart. When they were sick, it humbled me. I, I wanted to pray for them. I Wanted to, I wanted them to be well. He goes further and says this, I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer returned to my own heart. They were so evil they wouldn't even receive the prayers that were being offered for them. Then he says in verse 14, he says, I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavenly as one who mourns for his mother. 
We all maybe have images in our mind of people that have paced the floor when someone else is really sick. I've been in the hospital rooms with not near as many people as Pastor Dan has over the years in pastoral care with someone that's got a loved one that's facing a life-threatening surgery or something and in the nervous energy of them just pacing the floor and calling on God and praying and asking God to do something. I remember the many times in my home growing up as a kid when one of my little brothers would be sick. I remember my mom would be worried about them and she'd be pacing to and fro in the house praying for them. She had this, she had this compassion for them obviously because they were their chi- her children. And David was saying this, even them that are against me right now, there were moments where I bowed heavily, heavily down because of the what they were going through in the sense that I did not want to see that happen to them. But have they done that for me? No. David's pleading is case here again, beginning in verse 1, all the way down to here of showing God the things that God already knows, but making statements about it. But he says in verse 15, this is what happened despite all of the, all that he's shown to them. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me and I did not know it. And then this phrase just stuck out at me all week long. They tore at me and did not cease. What a tragic place to be when you've done good and yet people are almost as if the figurative language there are tearing at your flesh, tearing at your life, coming against you in such a vile way. And yet David was able to keep his heart right before the Lord. I think sometimes we really need to guard our hearts more than we really do. When things are going wrong in our lives and people are speaking against us, we need to guard our hearts. We need to guard them, especially, hear me, if you're getting that information about you, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth hand. Irma Bombay wrote years ago in one of her books, she said it takes two people to really hurt you deeply. One is an enemy to say something about you, and two is a friend to come and tell you all they said. Listen to me. Guard your hearts and minds. Guard them. It's the the wellspring of life, the Bible says. Guard your heart. You want it to be soft before the Lord, not bitter and angry. You want it to be one that's pliable and teachable in the presence of God instead of someone that has been hardened by the things of this world. I refuse to let those that are not right with God around me to affect me to the point to where I'm no longer right with God. Listen to me. Nobody wins in that. You want to win over the enemy? You want to win over Satan? You want to win over those that hope that you lose? Keep your heart and mind right before God and stay soft in His presence and before others. It will do something. David is, David is making an example of this for you and I by what he's saying here. Now, now, I want you to remember also, it's not like David was just such a pushover and a softy. Or, or it's, it'd be one thing if David writes all of this, but he didn't have a chance to get revenge. On at least, that we know of in the Bible, two occasions, David could have taken the life of Saul, and he did not do it. The world would say, do it, man. You've got every right in the world to do that. Take him out right now. Do it while you got the moment. Get him while he's, un- while he's unaware and take him out. Saul actually even admitted in 1 Samuel chapter 24 that David was the better man. You see, David had kept his heart right before the Lord even when everything around him was going wrong. Now remember I told you in the beginning that David kept praising the Lord at the end of all three of these requests of the Lord, at the end of all three divisions of the Scripture in this chapter, David offers a praise to the Lord. The first one he offered to the Lord in verse, verse number 9 was a personal praise that he offered to God when he said, My soul will. Now what I want you to see here is in verse number 18 now, this second expression of praise is in the congregation in God's house with the fellow saints. 
Listen to the verse 18. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. I've said it here before. I'm going to say it now. And I'm certain if I get to live many more years, you will still get to hear this again. A rotten day, a bad experience, a foul mood, or anything else is never, ever, ever a good reason not to go to church. It's just not. There is no reason for that. Someone said something bad about you and your feelings are hurt and you're going to skip church because of that? Come on. David is saying here that even though he's being hotly pursued, his life is in danger, people are returning evil for his good, and many other things that he's cataloged for us already, and we're not done yet with the list. He says this, I'm still going to go to church, and I'm still going to praise you with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, because that is right and good in your presence, God. And you and I must take a lesson from David's playbook, and that is this. When life is difficult for you, continue your personal praise to God. Get up in the morning and offer it to Him. Give it to Him all day long and right before you close those eyes at night. But also there should be a public praise offered to God, that you're in God's house and worshiping Him. And I'm really glad you're here tonight to worship with us. Number three is this. David made a third request to God, and that was this. He asked God to vindicate me, to vindicate me. Look in verse 19, and this segment will take us to the end of this chapter. Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. Notice there David is able to say that there, he's being hated without a cause. Okay? Verse 20, for they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful matters against the quiet ones in the land. They also opened their mouth wide against me and said, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. This you have seen, O Lord, do not keep silent. O Lord, do not be far from me. Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication, to my cause, my God and my Lord. Verse 24 is his request. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to whose righteousness? God's righteousness, according to your righteousness. And let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, ah, so we could have, so we would have it. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And notice his praise here. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and your praise. I love this part all the day long. The Bible's very clear about how we're to praise God. The Bible's very clear that we are to praise God. And the Bible's very clear about how often we should praise God. And this is not the only place in the book of Psalms that says it. We're to praise God all the day long. Another phrase in the book of Psalms says, While I have breath in me, I will praise the Lord. David is up against some really bad, difficult things. And he did not for a moment he still laid his hurt out before God. He still is stuck in this difficult situation, but he did not let it change him or move him away from praising God. The enemy has a confidence in this last section that they have won and are about to win. They're confident it's going to be so. And David still did not surrender. Instead, he still praised God. He still sought God. He still asked God to deliver him and to vindicate him. And then he closed out, like we said in verse number 28, with that verse that says, And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. 
When I got to chapter 35, I must admit when I read it, the first kind of broad stroke of it, and I'm giving you a little bit of a segue into some observations or some helps that I want to give you here at the end. I read through it and I was like, I don't know any preacher that really gets excited about preaching from a psalm that's an imprecatory psalm. You know, kick out their teeth, God, and may their children all be ill, you know, that kind of a thing. I mean, come on. I mean, any preacher would take delight in that. It's just kind of weird, you know. And I remember looking at it, and then I looked at a couple of chapters ahead, and I'm like, but this is a really good one, you know. I'm like, there's a whole bunch of shouting hallelujah in this one, victory, you know. But I knew we needed to be here. And as I, so I, I drilled down. I'm like, God, I, you want me here? Fine, great. I, I told you I'll preach whatever. You know, you just got to help me. And I drilled down on it. And the more I drilled down on it, the more I began to realize how appropriate it is for all of us, whether you're in this situation now or you will be again at some point in your life. When wrongfully accused, when talked about behind your back, when hurt by someone that you thought would never hurt you. Loss of a relationship. A breaking up of a relationship. Loss of a job by who you thought was boss number one, super boss of the year, and dropped you as quick as somebody would drop a penny. We all have those things that happen in life. And David allowed to display his hurt for you and I, for our learning. For you and I to be able to see that not everything from Genesis to Revelation is shouting victory. Some of it's a battle cry saying, God, I need you and I need you now. And oh, by the way, while I'm waiting on you to get here, I think I'm going to praise you. While I'm waiting for you to get here, I'm going to lift up your holy name. While I'm waiting for you to visit me, God, and defend me because you said you would. I'm going to worship you, God, and I'm going to praise you. So what do you do in your life when these things come against you, when you've been hurt, wounded, when you've been left in the dirt and you don't know where to turn? I want to give you what I believe are some, some helps that I believe God gave me to put at the end of this message to help all of us, me included, in whatever difficulties we face in life, four of them. I can't remember that study guide you're holding has changed about eight times in the last three weeks. So I'm unsure what you're holding. But do you have four things in your wrap-up? You have four things there? I see a few amens. Okay. I'm going to give you a little bonus on each one. Okay? That's how it is. So you don't even have the finished copy. I do. <laughs> the first one is this. When you face these similar situations like David, number one, always take your pain to the Lord. Go to God with it. Can you call the pastor and make a counseling appointment? Of course you can. But we're going to ask you, have you been to God for it? Have you taken it to the Lord? And if necessary, here's your bonus. Take it to God over and over and over and over again until he comes through for you. David did. Paul did in 1st 2nd Corinthians chapter 12. He didn't just pray once, he prayed three times your pain to the Lord. Number two, tell the Lord how you feel and ask Him for His help. Ask Him for His help. Part of this asking God for help, here's your bonus, can be to ask God to deal with the person and or persons who acted unfaithfully or unjust or wrongly toward you. Say, God, I see it, but I know you see everything, God. So I'm asking you, will you defend me, God? Will you stand up for me? I'm your child, God. Number three is this. Leave the resolution of the matter in God's hands. I'm going to say that one again. I know you've got it already written down for you, but I want you to hear it again. Leave the resolution to the matter in God's hands. In God's hands and trust that God will do exactly what should be done. Here's your bonus, including the when, the how, and the who of it. Leave it all to God. Nobody's going to be able to do it better, more effectively, or with eternity more in mind than God the Father. Nobody. Number four is this. 
sing praises to God about what you know is true. Sing praises to God about what you know is true. I'm a little bit of a techie guy. I enjoy stuff like that. I, I use a music app that I have unlimited music from what they offer. Part of the perks of that is I can make my own playlist. I have several of them. I, I'll tell, tell you a few of them. I won't tell you what the songs are, but I'll tell you a few of them. I have a playlist that reminds me of my little boys. It was some songs that we used to sing when they were real little kids in the truck when we drove as evangelists down the highways headed to revivals. I have another playlist of songs that remind me of my wife Lola. They're songs from our wedding and songs from our wedding reception and when we were dating. And, and uh, especially if I ever have to be away from her long periods of time, I, I, I just like putting those on and I really miss her. I also have a playlist in there for when I'm having a dirty, rotten, lousy, no good, dirty dog day. <laughs> And I've got some good ones in there. I've got some good hymns that'll just make the devil angry, you know. I've got some songs in there that remind my soul it's really not all that bad. And I have to tell you, that playlist has been played. <laughs> and more than once. And I can tell you this, when I discipline myself to say, God, I'm going to praise you no matter what. I'm here to tell you, I may get done praising God in that worship session, and I'll still have a pack of problems, but everything has changed because I decided to praise God. And it's the reason why I told you to sing praises to God about what you know is true. Sometimes we doubt some things. Sometimes we wonder about some things, but not everything. That one little doubt you have, if you let it go unchecked, is going to turn into a big old cloud of doubt. So begin to remind yourself of what you know to be true about God. David gave us some examples, and I'll leave this with you in closing. And they are this, the Lord is our salvation. Verse number three. He also could sing that none is like the Lord who rescues the poor and needy. Verse number 10. He also showed us in verse 27 that God delights in the well-being of His children. And a fourth one that David shows us here in verses 24 and 28, that God can be counted upon to act since He is always righteous and true. God loves us. He will defend us. Our job is to keep our eyes on Him. Not the one that hurt you not the one that pursues you, not even the enemy himself. Stop giving the devil so much attention. Yeah. He's done. He's defeated. He's the enemy of God and the enemy of you, but if he's God's enemy, I got a feeling it's all going to be just fine. Let's pray. We love you, God. We're grateful for your word. It reminds us of some of these most practical things, God, that we can come to you in the midst of difficulties, God. And even, Father, the things that just seem so urgent and pressing. The things, God, that just seem to be almost out of control in our lives, God. Father, we trust you with them all. Father, in the moments when we begin to doubt or when the moments when we begin to give in to our flesh and think we've got to do it on our own, God, remind us that this battle really does belong to you, God. It is a just cause of your good against the world's evil, God. Remind us that you will defend us. Remind us, God, that you will be there for us. And never let us give in to our fleshly weakness, our fleshly thoughts, God, that you won't do this or do that. But instead, you are the one true living God in heaven above who loves us, who cares for us, and will always defend us. Keep your eyes closed for just one moment longer, please. I just sense that someone here tonight or someone's plural is struggling with some bitterness you've learned to live with it you think you've managed it but it's just kind of rooted in your life someone has hurt you someone has wounded you someone has done something 
to upset you, someone, maybe, maybe just something that was just so unfair. And as much as you want it to not be there, you've allowed bitterness to settle in and you've nursed it, you've watered it, you've fed it. And now you got this spot, this, this one spot in your heart that you've surrendered to the land of bitterness. And I'm here to tell you tonight, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth holding on to. Because bitterness is never static. Bitterness never shrinks. Bitterness will only grow bigger and deeper and farther unless you allow God to root it out of your heart. It's the only way it can happen. As I began this prayer tonight, just moments ago, I, I felt this heaviness. I don't know how to describe it to you, but as a preacher, I sensed that that's going on. So hear me clearly. If you're here tonight and you have that in your life, you should take this that God is speaking to you. He wants you to know that He sees where you're at and He wants you to know that He can take care of whatever that is. He can root it out of your life. It'll make you more free, as our pastor talked about earlier. It will make you more open to praising God. It will change your current relationships and your current attitude and your current status and all levels of your life. But it begins with you saying, God, I surrender this to you. God, I need you to take this out of me. So will all of us together, you and me, Pastor Dan, will you join now in prayer? Let's pray. If you're that one, give it to the Lord right now. If you're not that one, will you pray for whoever that might be in this room right now? Pray for them. Pray for them that God will help them in this moment. I sense this to be a God moment, and I would be unfaithful to move past it. So let's pray. Father, we call upon you right now for any person in this room, God. Whatever it might be that they're holding on to, God. Maybe, Father, it's shame of abuse as a child and they're bitter, God. Maybe it's a broken relationship, God. Maybe it's the unfairness of an adult child or someone else that has wounded us, God. Maybe, Father, it's just unfair circumstances in life and we've allowed ourselves to believe that no matter how often we put our head up, we're going to get whacked back down, God. Whatever it is, Father, I ask you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would give these individuals courage to surrender it to you, God, to allow you to root it out of their lives. And in the words of our pastor that he quoted earlier, whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed, God. And Father, they can be set free from the bitterness, set free from it, God, to live more openly and fully and more, and more toward you, God, than ever before, God. Father, we need you now. God, I know what you've done in my life over the years of the bitterness that I'd allowed to dig deep into my heart. And I remember, God, clearly the altar and the moments and the places, God, where you rooted it out, God. And you set me free, God, to love more, to, to be more of who you want me to be, God. And Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for that. I praise you for that. Let's stand and join Chris tonight. Let's sing this as a way of dedication, as a way of saying, God, you're awesome. Let's sing it together tonight. I know the